Next on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Exports play a very important role in the success of the U.S. beef industry. And today we have beef producers and industry leaders joining us to discuss the challenges and opportunities for U.S. beef exports. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Russell Nimitz sitting in for Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. You know, it doesn't matter what sector of the U.S. beef industry you're involved with, demand matters. And cattle prices are influenced not only by strong domestic demand, but also by international consumers of U.S. beef. In fact, the importance of U.S. beef exports has been well documented, and economic conditions worldwide definitely do have an impact on producers. So today, we're going to spend a little bit of our time discussing U.S. beef exports and sharing thoughts, ideas, and insights about trade issues that we are all focused on. Joining us today are a few people who live and breathe the cattle business, and they're here today to share some of their thoughts on the importance of beef exports worldwide. Let me first introduce the folks with me today. Kevin Kester is a fifth generation California rancher. His family has a yearling stalker and commercial cow calf operation, and Kevin also serves as NCBA's vice president. Missy Bonds is a stalker operator from Texas. Missy is the youngest female to be elected to the board of directors for the Texas and Southwest Cattle Raisers Association. Renee Strickland and her husband have a commercial Brangus herd on their ranch in southwest Florida. Renee also serves as president of the U.S. Livestock Exporters Association. And Jack Field is a cattle producer from Washington State. And Jack also serves as executive vice president of the Washington Cattlemen's Association. We'll get the panel's thoughts on international demand in just a moment, but first, Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Brian Baxter has this overview about the importance of global markets for U.S. beef. There may have been times in the past when it seemed like a cattle producer didn't have to think much about what happened beyond the ranch gate. But those days are long gone and producers know the market for U.S. beef today is global. We've increased the number of cattle out there. Quality is extremely good, but we have to have access to uh, play on the global field if we're going to continue to maintain uh, these kind of markets and grow our industry, really, because it's 96 percent of all people live outside of our borders, and that's where the future for increasing uh, demand is. In fact, in the first half of 2016, the U.S. exported more than $2.9 billion worth of U.S. beef. And for the past 40 years, the U.S. Meat Export Federation has been working to build U.S. beef export markets worldwide. We've worked uh, aggressively on behalf of the beef industry for the last 40 years. It was started by leaders in the beef industry who recognized the, the growth opportunity in the export markets. 40 years later, uh, just taking Japan alone, we've exported just in the last 30 years $33 billion worth of beef to Japan. So I think uh, our forefathers who had this vision, I think it's been realized. So far in 2016, the export value of a beef animal was nearly $250 per head. And with growing populations in Asia, the Middle East, and Latin America, export markets look to offer solid, long-term demand opportunities for U.S. beef. I think you would find the average rancher in Oregon compared to five, six, seven years ago at the coffee shop is saying exports are good. Free trade agreements are good for beef. Just in the last eight years alone, when we hear people talk about trade, should we or shouldn't we, we've exported $1 trillion in U.S. agricultural exports in eight years. So the trade is good. It's, it's vital to the U.S. Uh, agriculture and especially to the U.S. beef industry. I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. So our panel today represents different areas of the country and different sectors of the beef industry. So it'll be interesting to hear their views on exports. And Kevin, let's start with you. It 
might seem like a simple question, but from your own experience, why are exports so important to cattlemen and cattlewomen here at home? Exports are very important for the future success of our industry. Uh, as we go along, they're going to represent 15, 20, 25, 30 percent of our total uh, volume of uh, income. So uh, looking down the road for my family's success in the ranch back in California, uh, our export market is where uh, our success is going to be because 95% uh, or more of the world's population is outside of the borders of the U.S. So the U.S. consumer can support our base, but for our growth, it's going to really be represented in exports. An important thing to, to add on to that is the products that many of our uh, customers in export countries re rely and, and uh, seek after are not highly uh, valued domestically. An example might be the tongue, the short plate, the liver. Uh, all products that have some level of, of consumption here domestically, but nowhere near uh, what we can achieve internationally, and then also looking at the price that those products command. So the export markets generate uh, an, a great opportunity to uh, increase the value of those carcasses. You know, with retail beef prices that can often seem high here at home, Renee, maybe explain why we export beef instead of selling all of our products to our own U.S. consumers? Well, as uh, Jack mentioned, you know, we've got a lot of products that our consumers here in the U.S. won't eat, not customarily, and that's where a, a lovely part of the export business goes. Um, I'm going to speak a little differently from a live cattle export because that's what I do. Uh, Strickland Ranch and Exports is not just a cow-calf producer, but we also uh, export live animals. And other countries are wanting our good genetics to improve the genetics of the cattle in their country. So that's a whole nother market for our cattle producers here in the U.S. is to be able to offer good seed stock, good genetics to uh, improve the genetics in the other countries. Yeah, absolutely. Another example of that is is with these products that we're exporting, most of them are not products that we're using. The tongue, for example. When, when the cow that stole Christmas happened, the value of the tongue dropped $10 a head per animal. That's huge when you talk about the amount of cattle that we produce here in the United States. You know, oftentimes we get stuck on thinking about our export markets only have to do with Asia, but to the contrary, Kevin, the, the world really is open for U.S. beef. It is, and it's hugely important to get these trade agreements passed so we're all on a level playing field. So um, it's, it's a, a big deal to not only get TP, TPP passed, but we have a European Union agreement that we're in negotiations with called TTIP and things like that. So it's very important to get these agreements passed where we're on a level playing field and we can win if we do that. Yeah. Russell, that, that point can't be overstated enough. You talked about the world being open to U.S. beef. It is, but we need to ensure that it's open equitably and that we have a level playing field and that our U.S. producers have the opportunity to compete on a fair and even field. And that's what uh, TPP will offer us uh, in these countries. And then hopefully the benefit of a successful TPP agreement will be uh, future agreements with other countries. All right, some good discussion so far, and we have a lot more ground to cover before we're all through. Coming up, we'll talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership and what this trade agreement could mean for the U.S. beef industry. Stay with us. Our panel of beef industry experts will be back for more talk on some of the tough trade issues right after this. There is a new world out there revealing itself in unpredictable ways. A world that demands more from the land and those who grow, farm, and build on it. This new world calls for the ingenuity to get more out of it while preserving as much as we can. After all, to stay ahead of tomorrow, we need to be equipped for it today. New Holland, equipped for a new world. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattlemen is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattlemen. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org and join today.
Welcome back to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen as we talk beef exports with a group of cattle producers and industry experts from around the country. Now let's turn our attention to one of the current hot button issues, the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP. NCBA continues to press for congressional approval of this vital trade agreement. Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Matt Fleck has a closer look at TPP. Visit a supermarket in Tokyo and you'll find American beef is a product many Japanese consumers want to buy and many are buying. However, because of a 38.5% tariff or tax, U.S. beef faces a big price disadvantage going into Japan. It's a situation that would be fixed if the Trans-Pacific Partnership wins approval on Capitol Hill. You know, foreign trade is a big priority for cattlemen. Uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership is the trade agreement of the day. We see trade as the key to markets for the future generation of cattlemen in this country. Well, TPP, as you know, involves 12 countries, 40% of the global economy, and some of the largest and fastest growing uh, markets in the world. So if you take a country like Japan, we face a 38.5% tariff on our beef exports. That'll go down to 9% ultimately. In Vietnam, uh, which is a, a country of 90 million people, growing 6% a year, an emerging middle class that wants more protein, better quality food, they want American-made products, they want American-raised beef, uh, those tariffs will go, to, will go to zero. U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman spoke to cattlemen and women in Washington, D.C. last spring and told them that in the Japanese market, Australia's price advantage will get stronger over time unless the U.S. Congress approves TPP. That's a major reason why cattlemen are being urged to deliver the message that approval of TPP is needed now because the lack of this trade deal is costing them real money right now. It's interesting to see the number of excuses that we have heard about not supporting TPP. The one thing that we hear other groups are concerned about what might happen. A lot of what if scenarios. I think what's different about us in the cattle industry is we can point to the what is happening to us right now and that is the loss of almost $300 million a year by not having access to the terms of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And it's important for Congress to to understand this has real implications for real people, for real communities, and the cattlemen are, I think, are very effective in conveying that. I'm Matt Fleck, reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Well, no doubt, the reason why the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, has been such a big priority for the NCBA is because it holds great potential for U.S. cattlemen and cattlewomen. And, Kevin, let's talk about why TPP is so important for the U.S. beef cattle industry. Sure, Ross. So the reason TPP is so important for the cattle and beef industry is that the 12 nations, of which the U.S. is one of the 12 nations, that are a part of TPP uh, represent 40% of the world's economic output. That is a big deal. So if we get TPP passed and have a level playing field, we'll be winners. In addition, Japan is our number one export destination for beef uh, in the world. Over the past two years, it represents uh, close to $3 billion of U.S. beef going over there. So. Uh, Japan's our biggest target of TPP it, it is a part of it, and so it all plays into being a huge part of the success for our future. Absolutely. You concur, Jack. Most definitely, and, and Kevin had alluded to probably one of the most important components. We look at Japan, and our that being at the top of the, the mark for the United States right now and our number one export partner. Uh, but the other big benefit we have with a, a successful TPP agreement is hopefully having uh, the ability to have uh, a productive negotiation with China. And uh, by being a part of TPP, we'll be on the front end of that. And uh, with those other countries that are all joined in unison going forward, absent a TPP agreement, I fear we could be left out alone. Uh, those countries may move forward. Uh, hard to say what they would think of the United States and our uh, abilities to negotiate agreements into the future. So I, I think the timing is critical and we need TPP now. Uh, we can't afford to wait. Yeah, very well said. Of course, the Australians have a trade agreement with Japan already. And Missy, has their agreement impacted our ability to compete for their consumers? It has because prior to this agreement, 
Australia and the United States had the same uh, tariffs. Well, now their tariffs have started to be reduced. And last year, their tariffs, instead of being at 38.5% like ours are, theirs were at a little over 30%. And they're planning on reducing those into, to where they will be a little under 20% by 2020. So going forward, we're going to continue to lose market share in the Japanese market if we don't get back onto an equal playing field with Australia. So Kevin, let me ask you this. If Australia can have a bilateral agreement with Japan, why doesn't the United States just negotiate a bilateral agreement with them as well? Well, that's a good question. And the answer is it takes years and years to negotiate successfully even a bilateral trade agreement. So to the points that have already been stated, we don't have the time to spend 10 years negotiating with Japan and maybe not even coming up with an agreement. So uh, just in the last six to eight months, we've lost hundreds of millions of dollars in market share in Japan to Australia because of that big, huge price difference in tariff rates. And so that will just keep getting wider and wider and we'll lose more and more market share and it's going to kill us. Let me, I'd like to reiterate something that uh, Kevin just said as far as having years of uh, getting these negotiations going. Also in the live cattle exports, it takes years to negotiate a health protocol. And TPP stands to pave the way to open some markets that we currently aren't open with right now, in, especially in Asia, uh, not just Japan, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, some of these other markets that are very big, upcoming middle class uh, economies that want good grain-fed beef. The Australians export 65% of their, their live cattle. Those aren't grain-fed. We've got a product that these consumers want. TPP will level this playing field, get these tariffs right, so that we can get into markets that we're not in right now. Russell, an important thing to build on that is right now, and it's what we've seen for uh, a number of years, the, the U.S. Meat Export Federation, the U.S. MEF, is working diligently on our behalf every day in these countries trying to uh, expand U.S. opportunities. Our, I recently had an opportunity to visit with a group of producers from South Korea. Uh, they want to know how the U.S. MEF works. They, they see that as a very effective tool in the Korean marketplace. I think given the infrastructure that we have, the, the great team we have working at U.S. Meat Export Federation, coupled with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we could see huge increases in opportunities for our industry moving forward. All right, thanks a lot, Jack, for the comments. Don't go anywhere because our panel of experts will have more insights on the Trans-Pacific Partnership when we come back. Stay with us. You know, there is a saying, hay lost in the field robs yield. That's why John Deere balers are designed with tightly spaced belts so you capture more crop in every pass. Compared to other balers with wide spaced belt designs, John Deere balers let you put up more quality hay and put more money in your pocket. That's how we run. And that's why nothing runs like a deer. And welcome back. Today we have a great group of beef producers here with me sharing their insights, concerns, and ideas about U.S. beef exports. Let's get back to our discussion on the important Trans-Pacific Partnership trade deal. And Renee, let's start with you first. You know, with TPP approval, what are some of the other benefits we expect outside of the increased access to the Japanese market? Well, Russell, I think that once we start getting into markets in a way that we haven't been able to before because of a, a more level playing field, uh, from the standpoint of live cattle exports, as, as Kevin mentioned earlier, sometimes it takes years to get negotiations going. Well, it takes us years to get a health protocol negotiated with other countries. TPP is going to help us uh, not only with the beef exports from the United States, but it's going to help get some health protocols into some countries we currently don't have. And that's good, it's just going to pave the way. That's a whole other market for our beef cattle producers here in the United States, not just semen, embryos, and beef, but live cattle as well. So that's giving us all another opportunity of another way to market our cattle. The TPP doesn't represent a one-way street. 
that we're also going to be raising those health requirements in those countries that would wish to import product into the United States. So TPP gives us another opportunity to help guarantee to our producers right here at home that our standards of production are also the requirements that they're having to operate and abide by to bring product into the United States. You know, basically these trade deals like TPP really do give us some stronger leverage, if you will. And the thing about it is, the world's not going to wait for us to make up our minds on TPP. They're going to move forward with or without us. Right. And so, to that point, one of the examples of that is how China is seeing trade in the Pacific Rim. Absent of TPP being passed and the U.S. being a leader in that, China is poised to go ahead and start right now. They're negotiating a separate trade agreement with a whole host of Pacific Rim countries as we speak. So if we fail to get TPP passed, China is going to be, by de facto, the leader going forward as an uh, economic trade leader in the Pacific Rim. And I think that's bad policy for the U.S. to lose that status. So it's important to get TPP passed so China is forced to come aboard the TPP because if we do pass it, for certain, China at some point in the future will want to join in and be a part of the success story of TPP. And we should overlook places uh, in, in addition to Japan for TPP, like Vietnam. That's also a growing middle class, and that's going to be a huge component, I believe, into the future where I can send products from our ranch through the chain and end up giving us uh, price supports in places like Malaysia Vietnam. Malaysia and Indonesia, those exactly. are emerging uh, middle class markets as well, yeah, so. and that's going to be a big market down the road too. Missy, a big question that a lot of folks have when it comes to the TPP and more specifically the beef cattle industry are what about the beef imports and should we or should we not be worried about the volume of imported beef from other countries under TPP? Well, when you talk about importing beef, a lot of people that don't understand think that we're bringing in steaks, ribeyes, tenderloins, but we're not. The U.S. consumer wants U.S. steaks, they want U.S. product, but the United States does not produce enough lean beef to meet our hamburger demand. So what we're doing is we're bringing in lean meat from other countries, such as these other countries that would be involved in the TPP, to meet that hamburger demand to mix with our lean trimmings. So that helps us answer the question about volume, but Renee, there's also that lingering question about safety. Safety. Safety's, a, safety's on the mind of everybody uh, when it comes to products coming in. You know, I think everybody can remember back uh, years ago around, uh, well, it was around 911, uh, when they had foot and mouth in, in the UK. You know, one of those cases, they had two bouts of it, and one of it was a piece of beef that was not properly handled, and, and in the FMD is just, it was devastating for the entire continent there. I mean, for the UK, it was awful. We fear this. TPP is going to help with phytosanitary regulations to level the playing field to make sure that any product that comes into the United States is as safe as our products that are going out. And that is important for us. We all fear FMD. And this is the, going to put the teeth into it to make sure that their products coming in will be safe and protect you know, the cattle ranchers in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree. I don't think that statement can be overlooked or could be highlighted enough. The, one of the big drivers that folks throughout the country, when you talk to people at home, want to talk about is the safety issue. And I think if there's anything that we need to really highlight and remind people is that, again, the idea that we're increasing the standards on both sides of the shipping and the receiving side of this equation, that uh, we're going to be able to guarantee to our friends and neighbors that those standards that we operate and abide by are also required amongst those that are going to be importing product into the United States, either on the hoof or in a package. And we've seen recent uh, rules go through uh, the process where states and, and national cattlemen have been very involved in, and I think this is another thing that will give us a chance to help ensure a higher level of, a level playing field for uh, the production side of the process. Yeah, it sure will. Well, we appreciate all of your insights, and we're going to have more on beef exports and the Trans-Pacific Partnership when we come back. So please stay with us. What does it mean to be dependable? It means you do what you say you'll do time and time again. 
Because performance isn't optional, and your task is essential. For over 95 years, we have proven ourselves to be the most dependable choice. That's why the cattlemen of this great nation trust Ritchie to provide fresh water on demand. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. Mosey on down to Music City and the 2017 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention and there will be a special event held at the Country Music Hall of Fame. Plus, Cowboys Night at the Grand Ole Opry. It's the 2017 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. In Nashville, February 1st through the 3rd. Visit BeefUSA.org for more. And welcome back to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlewin, where we've been sharing some of the pros and cons about the pending Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, or TPP, with a group of U.S. beef cattle industry experts from across America. And Jack, as we talk about the pending TPP, which is kind of stuck, if you will, in our nation's Congress, what message are we really sending our allies if TPP fails or just continues to be delayed? It, failure, in, in my opinion, failure is not an option. I, the United States has been at the table. We're, the United States is the, the leader in global commerce and needs to continue in that position. I think uh, lack of passage sends a huge question uh, and a pause to our trading partners as to our commitment to follow through on agreements that we've been at the table for several years in developing. Again, I, we can't stress enough the benefits that are in there for uh, beef producers for the United States and uh, not only just for us to benefit our, our new customers uh, and existing customers internationally. You know, Missy, we kind of talked about it earlier in the program that you know there's a lot of other countries involved with the TPP trade deal they're not going to wait around for us, and, and if we continue to stall, we're just only hurting ourselves as an industry. Exactly. If, if we continue to stall on TPP, then we're going to continue to lose market share in our beef industry and in exporting to these countries. Somebody else is going to take up the, the slack on where we're lacking. And instead of somebody else doing that, I would prefer for us to take their market share. I would prefer to send more of U.S. product over there than them taking ours. Russell, yeah. an important thing in terms of uh, capacity in our industry, one of the challenges we've seen with the reduction in our herd is a challenge to maintain our capacity in our industry from top to bottom. Uh, TPP represents an excellent opportunity for us to maintain a vibrant background in cattle feeding and processing industry which benefits and feeds into our ports. In Washington State we're extremely benefit. We've got the industry from ranch to rail, uh, but the, the challenge we face is we can't produce enough cattle in Washington State alone to sustain two packing plants and I think that can be extrapolated out across the country. We need to make sure we've got the market to export the product to make sure we can operate these plants, our feedlots and our ranches at the highest capacity possible to ensure that we're economically viable now and into the future. You know, we've been talking a lot about the Japanese market, but another big market in the Pacific Rim, obviously, is China, and it's been closed to U.S. beef since 2003. Kevin, what impact would TPP approval have on this huge potential market? Like I stated earlier, it would have a huge impact, especially it relates to China going into the future. There's no doubt that China will want to join TPP once it gets agreed to and is put into place. And so if that comes to be and China opens up access uh, unlimited to, uh, for the U.S. beef, it's going to represent essentially billions of dollars in the future for all of us. And so uh, that's hugely important. And so the U.S. can be a leader in the trade in the Pacific Rim. China can come in and also participate. But for us to have open that market, live cattle and meat and all our other products, it's going to represent billions of dollars and billions of dollars. And all the way back to our ranch, that's going to help keep us in business. As I like to tell people, I'm the fifth generation. Uh, my wife, June, and I have a granddaughter now, our first one. She represents the seventh generation. It's going to take things like that 
a success to have those extra billions of dollars going overseas to help keep our seventh generation on the ground and being successful. So Jack, let me ask you this. With the Chinese negotiators using beef access as leverage for larger compromises with the U.S. negotiators, how important is that Chinese market and is there a place the U.S. should be drawing the line on when it comes to concessions? I, I think the, the Chinese market is essential when we look to the future and I think it's very important that the United States be at the table and that we be uh, right there uh, uniformly and, and bilaterally discussing this with China. It, it, we need to be at the table, we need to stay at the table. Uh, we can't afford to have the terms dictated to us. Uh, we just need an even field between the United States and Canada and I'm certain that we'll come up with something that will work. The industry will survive uh, on both sides and the, at the end of the day we're going to have uh, happy customers uh, but we can't afford to wait. Uh, the Chinese market's far too important and valuable to us. Yeah, it sure is. Well, stay with us. We're going to have some more insights from our panel of industry experts right after this. Every truck can tow a boat. Every truck can climb a hill. Every truck can haul a trailer. But not everyone can say they're the fastest growing truck brand in America. Guts Glory Ram. And welcome back to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen as we continue to get insights from beef cattle producers into the concerns, challenges, and of course the strategies of success for U.S. beef exports. All right, gang, let's talk about some of the other trade agreements out there that the United States has been part of over the years and if there has been some lessons to be learned, if you will, about what might happen under TPP. A big one that I remember, and it's hard to believe that it's already been 20 years ago, was NAFTA, and now of course is the agreement between Canada and Mexico. Renee, you know, talk about NAFTA from your experience and maybe what we've learned and, and certainly what was gained. You know, sitting in on, uh, on APAC committee meetings with uh, Secretary Vilsack, we've learned that over the years, we did not get a level playing field in our previous trade agreements. And I think that's the big change that's coming on with TPP is that we are, we've learned from our lessons. We've learned things that were supposed to be beneficial that ended up biting us in the rear end. And I think TPP is going to be a much more level playing field. And that's why, again, it's, it's an ultra, ultra important that we do get this passed because it will protect us. It will keep us in the global economy. We're 5% of the population of the world. The United States is 5%, but we're 25% of the global trading. That's big. We're gonna lose that if we don't go along with TPP. And learning from these other past trade agree agreements, uh, TPP is gonna be a lot more fair. Kevin, can you believe it's been 20 years since we passed NAFTA? I do, time goes by fast when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to Renee, the follow up on Renee's, uh, it's important to realize that Canada and Mexico are also part of the 12 nations of TPP. And so signing that agreement levels the playing field for everybody, uh, all 12 countries, and that's hugely important. Give the U.S. cattlemen and the beef industry a level playing field, and consumers across the world will just want to buy our products, and that will help us all the way back at our ranch. You know, Russell, Russell, to follow up on NAFTA, and when we talk about Canada and Mexico, right now that consistently they're in the top five in terms of an export uh, destination for U.S. beef and, and a good trading partner. And the Pacific Northwest and Washington State, we see uh, uh, a lot of Canadian cattle come in. We import a lot of live and finished uh, fed cattle into our plants uh, and our feedlots in Washington State, which are then processed. We have the opportunity to export that product. Uh, through our, our seaports uh, or in other parts of the country, it, uh, the Canadian trade is similar to a horseshoe where we see a lot of live animals come in in the western half of the United States and the central part of the country is sending box product up into central and eastern Canada. So it's, it's a good working relationship. Uh, 
Certainly there have been some issues like Renee had touched on about some of the health, health barriers, but we've seen those recently go, go by the wayside with blue tongue and anaplasmosis. And my hope is that TPP is going to give us a stronger foundation for future trading agreements that we won't have to have some of those small um, non-scientific trade barriers get in the way of trade and we'll give our producers the opportunity to uh, have a level field and access to those great markets uh, that are represented in the TPP. And obviously Texas watched the NAFTA negotiations very closely as well. Yes, being from Texas, we, uh, we do import a lot of Mexican live cattle ourselves and turn them out onto wheat pasture. So in turn, we're, we're importing those live cattle then from Mexico. But in turn, Mexico is buying a lot of these products that we don't utilize here in the United States. And tongues, tripe, kidneys, livers, um, oxtail. That is something that we don't use here and it is a big market for Mexico. Well, there's certainly been a lot to learn from trade negotiations that happened under agreements like NAFTA. And of course, another big one um, not too many years ago was the Central America Free Trade Agreement or CAFTA. CAFTA. CAFTA's been, uh, it's been you know, very effective. And, and most recently, Russell, is uh, South America. We have just opened up markets for live cattle with Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, um, Colombia. And these are, these are some really viable markets that want live animal, uh, they want embryo semen, they've been getting some of that, but these are some brand new markets that have just opened up and emerged. And again, these are, you know, these are, these are other opportunities for our cattle producers. You know, with that said, let's take a closer look at CAFTA's impact on beef trade. Recently, reporter Brian Baxter had a chance to get a firsthand look at some of the expanding opportunities for U.S. beef in Latin America. Check out a restaurant menu in Panama and you might be surprised to see U.S. beef featured prominently. This butcher shop and restaurant in Panama City leads the way in promoting U.S. beef for their customers. It's a scene that's growing more common as economies in Latin America grow and as the Central American Free Trade Agreement approved back in 2005 continues to open the door wider to U.S. beef exports. Panama, where we're at right now, is a good example of a free trade agreement. We have declining duties, uh, getting everyone more on a level playing field. So the, the free trade agreements, without a doubt, are the, it's sort of the spark for the engine. But the, the underlying demand and supply dynamics are there anyway. The reality is that they don't have enough production to meet their increasing uh, demand. U.S. beef, is the perception that the people in Latin America has about U.S. beef is a really good quality product. Why? Because the consistency of the product, because of the marbling, the tenderness, and that they know that whenever they can try this product, they know it's going to be always good. The U.S. Meat Export Federation hosted their sixth annual Latin American product showcase in Panama City. The event put U.S. beef exporters face to face with 120 buyers representing 14 different countries in Central and South America. The sale of U.S. beef to these markets has been directly impacted as tariff barriers have steadily come down over time under CAFTA. We do have some more open doors now than we did 10 or 15 years ago. So we're seeing that product coming down here now. Since last year, CAFTA has become the difference, I should say, in, in regarding beef. The reason is because the tariff is getting to the point that it has become a very, very interesting for a select grade. Since the beginning, the choice is zero tariff, so it's not much of a problem. That was the way it was being established since the CAFTA was written. And this is because the choice is not competition for the local producers. But now, over the years, the tariff on the select, it has been reduced. So that is something that is a new opportunity for these countries that in the past they were only able to buy choice because of the tariff. In the first half of 2016, the sale of U.S. beef and beef variety meats to Central and South America has been worth nearly $80 million. In Panama City, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen.
And of course, there are still a number of different markets around the world that still have non-tariff based trade barriers to U.S. beef and Missy, one of them is the European Union. As the European Union has a hormone restriction that the United States meets that restriction with the non-hormone treated cattle program. And the European Union is a beef eating region and they want our product. And there is, there has been a exponential growth in this, in this uh, marketplace over the past 10 years. It sure has. And another area, Kevin, that shows great promise for U.S. beef exports is Russia. Yeah, we're closed off to Russia right now for political reasons. Uh, up until we got cut off uh, two or three years ago, we were exporting almost $400 million worth of our product into Russia. So if we could get Russia reopened, as one example, we, that, that market could be a half a billion up to a billion dollars in the near future. I'd like to add that they want a lot of live cattle, and we we actually can still ship live cattle to Russia. Uh, that's that window's been open still, and a lot of cattle have gone to Russia over the last few years. But that is a huge market. And you said Africa shows great promise yeah. for U.S. beef exports. I really think that we've. I think the U.S. has just overlooked Africa. Maybe it's a, a fear factor or something. There is infrastructure problems within Africa, but a tremendous amount of beef is supplied out of. Eastern Africa, Somalia and Ethiopia, those areas, but the quality of those cattle, the quality of that beef is not, not even near the quality of ours, no offense, but you've got emerging middle classes in Africa in a lot of the countries, Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, a lot of these countries have emerging middle classes, they've got a taste for good beef, and they want our beef. You know, you mentioned live cattle imports, uh you said China also has tremendous promise. China down the road. is the big elephant in the room, and they their appetite for live cattle is huge. They import a tremendous amount of live dairy and beef cattle, and that is a whole nother big Kahuna market. If we once we finally work out trade negotiations with China, absolutely. Jack, any final thoughts, I guess, as we kind of talk about trade and hopefully getting the Trans-Pacific Partnership through Congress? Well, I think whether we're talking about uh, countries within the TPP or whether it be the European Union or Russia, the, the biggest uh, thing we have is that we've got a business here in the United States and our model is built on uh, uh, the free market. If our industry has a chance to compete, uh, that's all we're asking for and we'll be able to supply the world with the highest quality, safest beef produced. Well, let me just say, I appreciate you, every single one of you, for joining us on today's program to talk about the importance of trade and, and hopefully getting the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, through Congress. So thanks for being with us. So we invite you to consider becoming a member of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association to help unite with others who share your values and want to protect the way of life in the cattle industry. To join the NCBA, just call 1-866-USA-BEEF or go online to beefusa.org. Don't go away. We'll be back with everyone's friend Baxter Black and more right after this. Long range, huh? It says here in a weight gain trial of 15,000 stockers, parasite control with long range outperformed five other dewormers by an average of 28 pounds. Extra 28 pounds per head. Wonder what that'd feel like. Do not treat within 48 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows or in veal calves. Post-injection site damage such as granulomas and necrosis can occur. These reactions have disappeared without treatment. You have a lot to gain with long range. Parasites will lose you more money than any other disease out there besides infertility. So, you know, parasites is something that we have to control, and that's what Vet Gun does for us. It's tough out there on a the ranch, but with the ease of the Vet Gun, it's a one man operation. And whenever you can get one thing to work out great throughout that day, it just makes my life a little easier. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, 
and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. Have you seen Mauna Loa? I asked Will. No, he replied as a foot-high wall of concrete began covering his boot toes. It's a volcano in Hawaii, I explained. The cement truck driver added to our education by pointing out that five yards of concrete weighs 20,000 pounds. Now, it's not that we're complete novices around cement. We've poured footings, built rock walls, and driven over lots of concrete cattle guards. We built a form, and the form was to be for a freestanding stem wall, four by two by 16, thus 4.74 cubic yards. 7 a.m. on the dot, the giant concrete truck rumbled in. The driver backed up to the spot and swung his long chute out over the top of the form. It looked like the dull ovipositor on a gigantic wasp squatting over a tarantula's hole. In retrospect, I realized the driver had probably seen cowboy projects before and anticipated excitement. Are you ready? He asked gleefully. Let her rip, I said, like a man in front of a firing squad. Standing next to a cement mixer truck as tons of gravelly concrete roll down the chute can rattle your brain. As the cement reached the two-foot level, the sides of the form began to bulge. Will asked, do you have any cardboard? An interesting question, I remember thinking. Something General Custer might have asked as the Indians closed in on him. Well, we tried to stem the bulge by driving stakes in the ground, but the gray mass simply wedged its shoulders up under the form and lifted it off the ground. Stop! The churning mixer stopped. Another 900 pounds of concrete clattered into the form. A tide of lava surged from underneath and rolled the length of two shovel handles before it sludged to a stop at Will's feet. Mauna Loa, he repeated. Never seen it. Yeah, I said, but now you don't have to. This is Baxter Black from out there. All right, thanks a lot, Baxter. We really do appreciate your wit and wisdom each week. Now, if you'd like to rewatch an episode of Cattlemen to Cattlemen, or even catch up on anything you've missed, then just visit our YouTube page. You'll find replays of all of our shows filled with information, educational segments, and of course, the producer profiles from around the country. It's also another chance to check out Baxter Black. So check us out at youtube.com slash cattlemen to cattlemen. We'll be back with some final thoughts from our producer panel right after this. I'm an NCBA member because NCBA, they look at the facts, they look at the history, and they look what's good for the industry. It's important to be NCBA members just because of what NCBA does. They keep us informed about a lot of things that are going on nationwide. The reason we're an NCBA member is we think that it's the best voice that the cattle people have. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. As we wrap up our program, I'd like each of our panelists to share some final thoughts on the issue of beef exports. And Kevin, let's start with you. Sure, I would like to encourage all producers and cattlemen across the country to study what TPP actually is. Don't fall into the political rhetoric trap that we've all been hearing with this political silly season with the elections coming up. Investigate yourself. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ag organizations supporting the passage of TPP. So I encourage my fellow cattlemen, please do your own homework. Don't fall into the political rhetoric and see what conclusion you come to after you study it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ramp up and say something similar to what President Obama and Secretary Vilsack have been saying. We cannot afford to not be a part of TPP. It would be devastating. 
uh, especially from the agricultural output, to not be a part of TPP. You will see our numbers crash down over the years, and we can't afford to go there. I see. I would like to say that it, to me it doesn't matter if it is TPP, China, Africa, what country it is. The more reduction that we can have in tariffs and open our, our barriers, so long as it is not a human health or an animal health issue, it is a benefit to the beef industry. And Jack, you've got a very strong take home message. Well, TPP represents a great opportunity for our industry, a level playing field, and that opportunity to increase U.S. access to international markets. Uh, the only way we're going to get there is if we have uh, all of our members of the audience and our, we all take the time to contact our members of Congress, urge their support and uh, passage of TPP. If people have questions about TPP, I would urge them to go to NCBA's website at beef.org uh, as well as tppnow.org uh, for some good factual information. And again, uh, please pick up the phone and send an email. Well, I sure appreciate, again, each of you taking time out of your busy schedules to join us here on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. You guys have done a fantastic job and, and hopefully we've done our best to share the message for all the folks at home about the importance of getting TPP passed for the U.S. beef cattle industry. And of course, we want to say a special thanks to our panel, Kevin Kester, Renee Strickland, Missy Bonds, and of course, Jack Field out of Washington State. So that's going to wrap up this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks to you for watching. I'm Russell Nimitz. And we'll see you next week right here on RFD TV.